Jesus. 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 Joshua chapter 1 verse 9. God doesn't just say that this is to do not fear and don't be dismayed. He, he, did, he didn't just say don't, don't, don't be afraid. He said, he started it out with this is what I'm commanding you. Which tells us, he's not just telling us don't be afraid. He said, I am commanding you. My God. He said, this is my command. This is what I'm commanding you. Do not be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Why am I commanding you this? Because I am with you. Jesus. So many times we get gripped with fear and gripped with all these cares of the world and worry and doubt and everything. But what's amazing is that Jesus is saying, I am with you and I'll be with you wherever you go. And this is my command. He is our commander in chief. It's as though Jesus is saying, get up, soldier. Get up. I am commanding you. To not be afraid and to not be dismayed because I am with you. The Bible says he's with us when then to the ends of the earth, Auntie Renee. What an amazing God we serve. He never stops working. Even if we can't see it. Even if we can't hear it. Even if we can't feel it. He never stops working. And that's why he's commanding us to not be afraid because he never stops working. To not be dismayed because he never stops working. Let me tell you. I'm not, I'm not coughing because of that. I'm coughing to clear my throat. Let me tell you what the word dismayed means. A lot of people know the word dismayed to be afraid. And this may does also mean to not be afraid. But Jesus is not here saying, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. He already weighed one command, and that is do not fear, period. He don't have to repeat himself because there was already one command. Can I hear an amen? So, but he said, do not be afraid. And do not be dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with you wherever you go. I'm going to help somebody out uh, this morning as the Lord has had me in my war room on my face. And uh, this scripture right on my mirror, right in front of me. The word dismayed means to be out of place. He said, do not just, do not be afraid, period. That's a command. But then the Lord says, do not be dismayed, which tells us, don't get out of place. My God! Which tells us, you have to stay on the right path and stay there no matter what, because he is with you wherever we go. Now, the word dismayed also means when someone is dismayed, that gives the enemy, oh God, I tell you, this is going to bless your life because this is supposed to be my ministry, what I'm going to minister about. But I'm going to give you a pre. This is a pre-course or whatever you call that. Pre, a preview. Preview. This means, this may means to get out of place, but guess what else this may means, Pastor? It means you can allow the enemy access to your mind to disillusion you did you hear what I'm saying and for all you scholars out there I pray to God that I said the right word thank you scholars but this is it the enemy 
You give access. The Bible says, this is what I'm commanding you, daughter. This is what I'm commanding you, son. Oh, Zion. Oh, Israel. This is what I'm commanding you. Do not be this. Do not be afraid. Don't get out of your place. Because if you do, you will allow the enemy access into your mind that will cause you to think of other things that God is not placing in your mind. He causes that spirit of delusion inside of you, and that's what he does. He causes that spirit of this, and that's what this may means, Auntie Renee. It means to think of something else that's not real. To think of something else that is not truth. So he throws at us things that is not truth. Yes. To get off all oh, no, the Jesus, my God, I hear you. To get off, off our path so that we can be afraid. Because when we know that God is for us, we know that the arrows that flyeth by night, the arrows that flyeth by midday, the arrows that flyeth in the morning, we should not be afraid. The Bible says, don't be afraid of the terrors of night, nor the arrows that flyeth by day. Do not be afraid for the disease that stalks in the darkness, nor the disasters that shites at midday. So will there be distractions? There are disasters passing in. Absolutely yes. But thou, O oh God, are a shield above me. He is my refuge. He is my strong tower. He is my help. He is my very help. And let me just share one more thing with you. Can I have my Bible? And I'm, I'm done. I'm done. This is... I want to just share something with you. Last night I was reading. I was reading. The Lord led me back to Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 19. And I remember this scripture because as I was writing it, as I was writing it of uh, Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 17, verse 19. I looked back and I said, God, wait, where are you? And I, I wrote, Pastor, as a Lord, I was in the book of Jeremiah 2, 19, and I'm reading that, and I'm underlining it. But I, and the Lord said, write this on a pad. So I wrote it on a pad, and, and, and I looked back, and it wasn't Jeremiah 2, 19. And I said, wait a minute. And the Lord said, you was reading Jeremiah 2, 19. But I want you to read Isaiah 2, 19. I had no clue what this meant, Pastor. And I said, okay, God, I'm going to be obedient. And the Lord said this. When the Lord rise to shake the earth, his enemies will crawl into holes in the ground. For they will hide in caves in the rocks from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. My God, my God. <laughs> Did you hear that this morning? The enemies will fear and tremble when there is a shaking. That's what is happening right now all over the world. The enemy is afraid. So they're throwing tactics. They're throwing tactics at the Christian people. They're throwing they're... Listen, and then God said, on that day of judgment, on that day of judgment, yes, hey, 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 yes. Jesus, on that day of judgment, they will abandon the gold and silver idols. Who is he talking about? 
the enemy. The disobedience. And then it says uh, they made up for themselves to worship. Oh, the enemies, those who made themselves idols to worship, will crawl in caves, afraid of the terrors of the judgment of our God. And they will leave. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh. On that day of judgment, yes, my God. they will abandon the gold and silver. They will leave the idol. Check this out. And then it says, for they will leave their gods to the rodents and bats. Ah. My God. Are you listening to me? Give, give, give me a little bit more, ma, a little bit more, just a tad bit more monitor, brother, and if you can. They will lead their gods to the rodents and bats while they crawl away into their caverns. Oh my God, how many of you want to still be an enemy of God? How many of you still want to be an enemy of God? If you are disobedient, if you have sin in your life, if you have disobedient and rebellion, you are an enemy of God. I'm on this pal. I'm on this pal. Pa- 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 is going to come up. They will leave their gods to the rodents and bats while they crawl away into caverns. Oh my God, what a day to watch. They wasn't afraid of him in the beginning, but judgment came. And all of a sudden, they're running back into their caves. And then it says, as they crawl away into the caverns, and hide among the jagged rocks in the cliffs cliffs they will try to escape the terror of the lord hey and the glory of his majesty as he rises as he rises to shake the earth my god then it says my God, my God, they, they're going to try to kill himself, Pastor. They're going to try to escape. They're going to do whatever they got to do because it's going to be rough. They think that this is rough, but it's going to be rough on Judgment Day. It's going to be rough, and you better be on the right side of Jesus' side. Hey, because if you're not, if you're not, Start making your case. <laughs> I'm almost pal. If you're not, start making your case. Hey, because you're already in the cave. You're already there. But start going deeper. Do whatever you got to do. Because when the fist, when the hand of the living God come crashing down, I tell you this, everything that is out of place will be shaken and removed. Say it the Lord God Almighty. What a chapter. I'm not done yet. So don't put your trust. Don't put your trust in mere humans. Hey. What is it telling you? Don't trust every prophet. Don't trust every pastor. Don't trust every believer. Don't trust every preacher. Don't trust every apostle. 
because right now in these last days there is a magnitude of false prophets that it will tell you that these things will not come and they'll tell you what you want to hear that what you're doing is okay that's a false prophet the Bible says these things will be shaken and you will if you're not in the right place you're gonna you're gonna do whatever you can to get rid of what you're feeling but he's not gonna let you you're gonna feel every judgment that's what he's saying and then it says to not trust in mere humans for they are as frail as breath and then one more then he said but the godly who is he talking to is he talking to the lazy Christians absolutely not he's talking to the people that is dying they're talking to the people that crucifies their flesh to know him more what does it profit of a man what does it profit a man to save the world to own everything or to own the whole world but lose the soul you can have all the riches that you want here on earth but if you're not set spiritually rich he's looking for the spiritually rich and then he says tell the godly that all will be well with talking to this morning ha? who is he talking to he said I'm telling you don't worry there is a shaking and there is a rumbling but don't worry because all will be well with you For they will enjoy the rich reward they have earned. Are you listening to me this morning? For they will enjoy the rich reward that they have earned. But the wicked are doomed for they will get exactly what they deserve saith the Lord of heaven's armies are you listening to me this morning saints of God where are you today Thank you, Holy Spirit. How many sermons do you need to hear to get your life right? Hey, Jesus. How many more worship music you got to listen to to get your act together? What does it have to take, saints of God? This is not a time to get out of place. Jesus, this is a time to go forward. Let me show you. Let me tell you, I shared this with the, with the women, Pastor, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tag you in just a second, okay? I shared with this, I shared this with just, with the women. See, this, this is what happens when the enemy tries to shut you up for almost four weeks. It's like, I, I'm all in, let's just do this right now. 
For the Lord shared with me this a few days ago. As I shared with daughters of Zion. We are so hungry. I'm so hungry. Hungry for the move of God. And uh, through that hunger. So many times we can get to a place. Where we're crying out to the Father. And we're on our knees. And we're, we're on our knees. And we're here. And, and we're like, Father. Father. I want more of you. I want more of you, God. I just, I, I, I need you more. And the question that the Lord had given me was, why are we asking God for more of him when we're not asking God or we're not telling God that I will give you more of me? Uh, are you listening tonight, this morning, whatever day you are? Uh, why aren't we asking God? I tell you, it, it convicted my heart, Pastor. And I sat there and I said, I'll give you more. I'll give you more of me, Father. I'll give you more of my time. I'll give you more time of intimacy, Father. I'll give you more time of worship. What is the Father looking for? The Bible says to draw near, then he will draw nigh. So why are we asking, Father, for more when we can't even handle what we... Why are we asking the Father for more when we can't even handle what He's given? We can't ha we can't ha we can't handle it. We can't handle it. So why are we asking the Father for more? We can't even handle what He's given us right now, Brother Alfie. So how much more can the Father give us? Think about it. I tell you this. If he was to give us everything of himself, we would fall and die. Is that what you want, saints of God? Now, pastor, are you telling me that I shouldn't even ask for more? Yes, I am. Because when you draw nigh, you receive already the more. And the closer you get to the Father, the more you know the Father. And the more you know who He is and, and what He's all about. It's not that He's giving you the more. You're getting closer. And the closer you get to the Father, the more you know the Father. So why... Are we asking God for more? He already is more. He already is the I am. He already is the, what should I say, God? What should I tell the people who sent me? Tell him. He didn't say, tell him, God sent you. He said, tell him the I am. Because God means everything. The I am has sent you. And what you're about to experience, Egyptians. What you're about to experience, Israelites. What you're about to experience, the I am is about to show you exactly who he is. So even if... I can't see him. He's still working. Even if I can't feel him, he's still working. He never stops. And even if it feels like he has stopped, he never stops working. He's a battery that never will run dry. He's a battery that don't need to charge. We're the one that needs the life supports. We, we, we're the one that needs the life support, Pastor. 
Yeah, we're the one that need though. Clear, 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 still dead. Here's the word, clear, still dead. Here's my presence, clear, still dead. My God. But not with God. He's already clear. He's already alive. There's nothing that you can do to make him even more. He already is everything. As pastor comes up, because I'm going to start continue to minister. And I know that God has a word. But I tell you this. Saints of God, I have battled for four weeks. Battled, 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 and battled. Well, pastor... How can you battle? Because, you know, you, you're strong. Let me tell you, every one of us will go through the fiery furnace. There's a song that we sing, I want to be tried by fire, purify. When I, th I sung that song, Brother Joe, and all of a sudden I said, wait a minute. I don't want to sing that song anymore because all of a sudden I was getting tried by fire but even if we don't sing it as a believer God is testing your faith as a believer God is testing your walk so he puts things in your life or should I say should I say it this way for those people that says oh God is putting it in my life let me tell you let me tell you let me tell you I'm, I'm almost power pastor let me tell you now God has a purpose and he has a plan and there's times that he will place and but the bible says that i am all about good and not evil so which tells us that god will allow just like job he allowed the enemy to try job and there's times in our life that god will allow the enemy but i'm going to tell you this not all your problems is with the enemy not all your problems is from the enemy because I tell you this so many times we blame the enemy and we look at the enemy and we're like I rebuke you enemy and the enemy said what are you rebuking but I love it anyway but what are you rebuking but I tell you this uh, many times in your life the things that comes in your life is because of you wow so true Very I'm almost power pastor it's because of you you allow things in your life as well. Don't think that the enemy won't come when you can play around with his fire. Hey, when you can play around with hell, when you can play around with disobedience and rebellion and think that nothing's going to happen to you. But God had brought it upon me absolutely not you have brought it upon yourself so saying all that to say this this is just a preview of what God is doing but this is just a preview saints of God it's time to wake up because if this is your last sermon you hear me saints of God if this is your last sermon, what will your destiny be? My God. Where will it be? Where? If this is your last sermon or your last worship, where will you be? The judgment of God is coming and it's already shaking. I tell you this. You better get ready. You better get ready spiritually to die for the Father. You better get ready spiritually to stand strong in these hours. Because if you don't, you will not be ready for when his hands and when his fist hits the nation. Because we're going to be attacked.
those who love the, the Lord, we're going to be, we're going to be persecuted, killed, martyred. Are you ready for it, saints of God? No, pastor, I'm not ready. I'm, I'm not ready. I'm not ready at all. But I'm telling you this. This is why you need to. This is why you're on here. You're not on her here just to check things out. You're on here so that you can get your life in order. Get your life in order, saints of God. In the name of the Father, the Son. Hold on, Pastor Cassie. Come back here. And the Holy Spirit. Brother Joel, get ready. I want you to pull up my third scripture. I want you to see something. Did you see my message? Oh, you didn't see my message. No, oh, look at that. You done almost preached my message today. On a day you're supposed to be resting. <laughs> I, about, I about lost it over there. I'm like, uh, you preaching my scripture, woman. <laughs> God is trying to let you know not from one pastor but from two what his word to you in this moment this hour is if you don't recognize what God is doing it's time to wake up people Can you just worship the Lord and just thank him for who he is? My God. My God. My God. Before we get into the word that we believe to honor, to give honor where honor is due. No, 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 no. We're not doing it after. You following my lead today, all right? Tomorrow is a very special lady um, of mine in my life. You know, she's the love of my life, apple of my eye, my bride, my honey girl, and I'm not going to give you all of our names that I have for her. It's private. My baby girl. Mm -hmm. But tomorrow is her birthday. And we just want to honor her. And on behalf of Faith in Action, we have a few things that we want to give to you and present to you right now for your birthday. Yeah, that's all blessing. All that sweat is all blessing. On a day she's supposed to be resting and under strict orders not to preach... She preaching. But we love you. I love you. All right. Now you can go sit down. Amen. All right. Are you all ready for the word today? All right. Yeah. You got to take me out of the monitors a little bit. Just a little. I need to stay here myself. I don't want to be screaming for nothing. All right. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to go into um, verse 24 through 27. I believe that there is a word in this. And just because you've read this, these scriptures before, um, do not take for granted that you know exactly what I'm about to share with you. You know, a lot of times, especially if you've been in the church for a while, we tend to think we know what the Bible says already. And we miss what God is saying now. Even when I was studying this, don't, don't, don't go to that scripture, brother. I, 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 I'll, I'll let you know what scripture to go to. I'm just letting them know to um, pull, pull up. Pull it up, but um, just follow along with me. Everything is in succession. So don't miss what God is going to speak into your life because you think you know what God is about to say. Are, are you all with me here? There are many times we miss what God is trying to speak to our lives because we've been in the church so long that we think that we've heard all the messages and we're going to miss. You'll miss what God is trying to speak to you now. What we need to understand is that there is a common theme and a message that God is speaking in this day and age. He is warning and preparing his people for what is coming. Remember Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, Indeed the sovereign Lord never does anything until he reveals his plans to his servant, the prophets. 
And yes, as Pastor Cassidy shared, there are many false prophets today. So you need to know the word so that you can know whether or not of, of what these prophets are speaking is of the word of God or is of truth. Not, not just because someone says in the name of the Lord or speaks in the name of the Lord Jesus does it mean that they are a prophet of God. Especially if they try to start off their, their, their words with thus saith the Lord, trying to sound very Old Testament. You don't need to say thus saith the Lord. You only, God only has to introduce himself to people he doesn't know. But if he's speaking to his people, they already know that thus saith the Lord. People try to sound more important than what they really are. But this message that is proclaiming throughout the earth and throughout the world through his prophets is to get ready. Because Jesus is coming soon to take his bride home. This is why we have to be prepared and we need to be ready to be with him because the Bible says that when he come, he's coming back. This is what you have to understand. He's coming back not just for any bride but for a spotless and a holy bride. As Ephesians 5, 25 through uh, 27 says, and, I'm, and this is speaking to husbands, but I want you to understand how this is related to what Jesus and what God is looking for. It says, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. In that he gave himself for her to make her holy and clean. Washed by the cleansing of, the, of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church that is what? Without a spot a wrinkle or any blemish instead she will be holy and without fault now if this is what he is returning or this is the this is this is the reason he gave himself for us okay this is the very reason he gave himself for us we have to ask ourselves are we without spot without wrinkle or blemish are we holy and without fault or as or has many who claim themselves to be the bride of Christ are only deceived in thinking that they are ready when they're actually not. There are many people that think that they're ready, but they're not even checking their lives every day. Not even seeking his face every day to make sure that they are ready. And can I tell you that God is using these events to shake the earth and its people to get our attention and to let us know that he is coming soon. And so we had better be ready because the storm is coming to reveal who his bride really is. Not everybody who says they are his bride is his bride. Title of this message. And I'm going to ask that everybody who's moving around doing stuff get back in here. If you are here, it is a privilege for you to be here. Do not be busy doing stuff and you miss the message. I mean, we work for four hours and take a break. You can at least wait for a little while before taking a break. We'll do it for the world, but we won't do it for God. My God. The title of this message is How Do We Stand? When the storm comes, can I tell you that there is a storm that is coming that many people are not ready for? And this storm is not one that is coming of natural disasters like a hurricane. This storm is about to shake this entire world. And we need to be ready because if you try to get ready when the storm hits, it's already too late. So would you pray with me, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for who you are, oh God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your, thank you, Father, for your mercy. Father, for your grace, oh God. Thank you for your spirit, oh God. Father, I pray that your anointing be upon me, Father. So much so, Father, that you would help me, Father. Lord, I cannot minister this word, Father. Without your help, Father. 
Lord, I pray that you would speak through me, Father. Let it not be my words that are heard, but yours, oh God. Lord, speak right into our hearts, oh God, as we know that your word, your word is alive and living and powerful than any two-edged sword, Father. It is able to go between the bone and the marrow. It's able to go between the soul and the spirit. It's, it, it reveals who we really are. Speak, Spirit of God. I pray, Lord, that you would prepare your people. That you would convict our hearts of anywhere in our lives that we need to change. Lord, and that you would convey your truth this day and bring enlightenment to your word, O oh God. In Jesus' name. And all God's people say, Amen. And amen. If you are standing, you may be seated. My God. Thank you. I want you to think about someone who's in a deep, deep sleep. Like a child or maybe a spouse. And let's say that you walk over to them and you shout out their name and they don't move. They don't wake up. What is the next thing that you would do? You would shake them to wake them. And can I tell you that this is exactly what God is doing? Because he is calling his people, but it seems they remain asleep. Distracted by so many things and not even listening to his voice when he calls. Many people are caught up in things that have become idols in their lives. And this shaking is going to happen so quickly that it will remove every distraction in their lives. Some people will run and hide in caves. My God, Pastor Katz is ministering this message. And others are going to do what I believe uh, is, is what uh, refers to these doomsday preppers who have these underground bunkers. Let's go to Isaiah Chapter 2 and verse 17 says, Human pride will be humbled and human arrogance will be brought down. Only the Lord will be exalted on the day of judgment. Idols will, be, will completely disappear. Idols will completely disappear. So everything that has our attention now and has become so important to us, from our jobs to our business to even our hobbies and even our cell phones, will be completely removed. There is coming a time that in this shaking, everything that we have so involved our lives into will be brought to nothing. And when the Lord arises to shake the earth, Isaiah says, his enemies will crawl into holes in the ground, into underground bunkers. And they will hide in caves in the rocks. You know how many people have been preparing for what is coming and not even realizing what is actually going to happen? They will hide in caves in the rock and from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. This shaking is going to return the fear of the Lord and people will come to recognize that God has always been God the whole time. For on the day of judgment, they will abandon their gold and silver. People have been talking about this, this economic collapse for years. And it's saying that money will have no value. They'll leave it for the rats and the bats. In fact, they're going to go into the caves and all, the ca all those cave dwellers are going to come out into the world. I don't think it's just a natural thing it's talking about either. They'll leave their gods. And the rodents and bats... To the rodents and bats, and they will crawl away into caverns and hide amongst jagged rocks and cliffs. And they will try to escape the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty as he rises to shake the earth. I believe that God will shake the earth to remove everything that we have learned to rely on. You know, I heard a, a prophet named Sandu, and he was talking about how 
you know, one of the first things that people nowadays, how we know that we're so um, caught up on uh, um, with our devices is one of the first things that people ask is when they walk into like a restaurant, you know, when it was open and <laughs> or, or go to a hotel. The first thing they ask is what is the Wi-Fi password? It's like we can't live without Wi-Fi. It's, it, it, it's amazing. How do we ever survive without a phone? I mean, at least I was old en- I'm old enough to remember what a beeper is. I mean, a beeper, you was rolling. Some of y'all remember the codes, you know, uh, 143. And, uh, yeah. and we had to go and find a pay phone and put a quarter in a phone to call. There was no phone calls on the go unless you, you know, when they first came out with the brick. <laughs> But everything we have learned to rely upon is going to be removed when God rises to shake the earth. It's going to be like when God took his people out of Egypt. The first place he led them to was not a place of abundance. He didn't lead them straight to the land flowing with milk and honey. He led them into a wilderness and he did it on purpose. Because in the wilderness, there is nothing. You have nothing but him. They didn't have anything when they they went into the wilderness. All they had to rely on God. And God will allow for your life to go through a wilderness to where you can no longer rely on all these things that you have been relying on so that you finally get your heart and and your attention back on him. Why? Because only when the distractions are removed do we actually seek after God. And can I tell you that the one of the first thing that's going to go is our electronics. Kiss the PS4 goodbye. (laughs) For all you gamers, I used to be one. Man, God had set me free from that thing. And our access, and I'm not saying if you play games, you know, I, I, I have to, you know, just as a disclaimer for Brother Ian, that, you know, his wife was speaking about him playing games and forgot to leave in, the, put in the part where he's actually seeking God more now. <laughs> I got you, bro. <laughs> but, but, you know, just because you play video games doesn't mean you're going to hell. But here's the thing is when that occupies your mind and even while I'm preaching this word, you're thinking about what game you'll play after church. then, uh, then uh, it's, it's, it's moved to a place of unhealthy. It's, it's become unhealthy. And see, one of the first things that's going to go is the Internet. The Internet is going to go. I mean, all these electronics are going to, and all these modern commodities that we have taken for granted, what, that, that we have become so accustomed to, what will we do when it is removed? And God will allow this to happen because we have become so distracted on what he's blessed us with, that we forget the blesser. Joel, in the, in, in the book of Joel, in chapter 3, verse 16, God says, The Lord will also will roar from Zion and, utterly, and utter his voice from Jerusalem, talking about the heavenly one, and the heavens and earth will shake, but the Lord will be a shelter for his people. Notice how he's saying, In this shaking, he's warning his people that if you'll find refuge in him, you'll be taken care of. And and you'll find strength. He will strengthen his children. But what is sad is the only, only when things start going wrong do we actually realize our need for God. For we have seen some of the greatest revivals that have ever taken place in the times of greatest need. And when times are worst... Or at its worst. But this is the purpose of the shaking. To turn God's people back to himself. And so God is trying to warn us. That a storm is coming. And we need to be ready. To face it. This is what Jesus was teaching. In this very famous. um, Scripture. or Famous teaching. In, In Matthew 7. In verse 24. He says. Anyone who listens to my teachings. And follows it is wise. The word therefore follows is obey. 
He says, you'll be wise if you listen to my teachings and obey them. It is like a person who builds a house on solid rock. It is likened to a person who builds his house on solid rock. For when the rains come in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and does not obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds his house on the sand. For when the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. What this reveals and what Jesus is teaching here is that there are two different kinds of believers. Those who are wise and those who are foolish. But what we need to realize is both hear his voice and hear his teachings. So this isn't referring to someone who is not considered a Christian from one who is not, this is actually talking about two types of believers and Christians. In fact, this is coming at the end of three chapters of teaching. Because if you'll look back into in chapter 5, 6, and 7, they're all in red. Because these are all the teachings of Jesus. And so at the end of his discourse of teaching, you get the, the, the Beatitudes and you have the, the teachings on money and you have the teachings on divorce and, and, and anger. And you have all these teachings that, that Jesus teaches about and, and he even teaches us to pray. He teaches us to identify false prophets and all of these teachings. At the end of these teachings, he then says... That a storm is coming that will affect both types of believers. Now, I want you to notice that the wise man was not left out of the storm. We think that if we serve God, that God will take us out of the storm. But what we fail to realize is God doesn't always take us out of storms. He sometimes, if we, and, what he's, and what Jesus is teaching us is that if you will take what I've taught you, it will give you the ability to stand in the midst of the storm and remain standing. But if you only hear the message and do nothing with it, when this storm comes, you will be the first to fall. So here's the immediate takeaway, right, right off the bat. Now is the time to prepare. Because when the storm comes, it will already be too late. So many people are waiting for things to get worse. I mean, you would have thought that the coronavirus would have shooken them to the point that they would start getting down on their knees and seeking a face of God. But there are still those who are so arrogant and prideful that they still have not bowed down to God. Even in the midst of this pandemic, they're still waiting for something bigger to happen. But let me tell you, something is coming that is bigger. But by the time that comes, you will not be ready. Pastor, what storm are you talking about? Well, if you look at the Olivet Discourse, and this is found, this is what covers in the Synoptic Gospels. For those of you who understand that talk, I'll break it down to y'all. Synoptic Gospels is the first three Gospels because they are so similar, so they're synoptic, they're similar. You'll find much of the same teachings. John, he went a different route and, 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 and a very personal route on it. But, but these three others are, are, are called the synoptic gospels. And in these three, there are a similar uh, teaching or discourse in which they, they, re, they call it the Olivet Discourse. In which we find uh, Matthew 24 through 25. And you also take Mark 13 and you also can look in Luke 21. This encompasses the, the uh, Olivet Discourse in which Jesus talks about about what will happen right before he comes he says nation will go against nation the greek word for nation there watch this is ethnos talking about ethnicity talking about race and so he's saying when before i come race will be against race are we in this day huh and then he says kingdom against kingdom these kingdoms is the uh, speaks of countries against countries are we in this day And then he says there will be great earthquakes. There has been earthquakes in, in this world. Like, my God, we have not. It is happening so rapidly and all over the world it is taking place. God is shaking the world. 
And people still don't take notice to it. He said there will be great earthquakes, not just earthquake, but earthquakes. And there will be famines and plagues in many lands. And there will be terrifying things and great miraculous signs from heaven. But before all this occur, occurs, there will be a time of great persecution. Now, now, I want you to understand what's happening here. Okay? He's saying all of these things are going to happen. The, the, all, all of these things are going to happen. And, and before it happens, there's going to be great persecution. Okay? This is what the Lord has been trying to prepare us for. So I want you to understand. He said, you will be dragged out into synagogues and prisons. And you will stand trial before kings and governors because you are my followers. But watch this. Notice that God, notice he doesn't say that I'm going to take you out of it. He says, when you're in that situation, that is your time to, that is your opportunity to tell them about me. Interesting way to think about this. This is so foreign to many believers today. My God, you're supposed to protect me. And God, that's not supposed to happen to me. I'm a believer. Really? Now, for most American believers, we don't understand what this type of persecution is. But believers all over the world are already facing this. Especially in China in the underground churches. Where they cannot even sing out loud. We, we complain in here in Hawaii because our governors have, called, have told us that we have to be, you know, we have, we have certain regulations on singing. They cannot sing because if they're caught singing, they are killed. And so they hold up signs and they sing silent praises to God. And they can't even have a Bible. So what, you know what kind of sermon is preached? They pass a sheet of the Bible to every person. And they read that sheet. And they hug it and they kiss it. Because that, that is their sermon. And that's all they have. My God, how many of you have a Bible or Bibles in your house? And have never even picked it up? See, if they're caught, they're drug out onto the streets. And I want you to hear what, what happens, especially if they're a pastor. They're drug out into the street, and they bring a steamroller and run the pastor over alive. Because he is a follower of Jesus. I remember a story of a family in China who was told to renounce their God or die. And they threw their entire family with their children into the hole and told them, renounce your God or die. Commit that you will not sing or praise him any longer and you will not tell people about him. And they said, no, we will not. He said, we're going to bury you alive with your children. And they began singing worship to God as the soldiers kept on throwing dirt after dirt after dirt. And you know what song they were singing? They were thanking God for the blessed life they had to die for Jesus. While well, we sing songs about God blessing us with more finance and comforts. These believers are singing, oh, what a blessing it is. To die for Jesus. But can I tell you, in the midst of all of this persecution, they are witnessing some of the greatest miracles. Including their homes where the believers would gather together, began to shake and tremble just like the book of Acts. And while someone was standing outside, looked over into the home that was right next door and not even a dish was rattling. While this whole house was shaking under the power of God. Can I tell you that believers there do not just join the church because they want more of Jesus? They don't join him out of convenience. They join knowing that they are going to die for their king. And they would gratefully cherish just one page of the Bible, but we have never, we have many Bibles in our homes, but have never even picked them up. 
Jesus continued and he said, so don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges against you. For I will give you the right words and such wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to reply or refute you. Even, he said, even the closest to you, your parents, your brothers, relatives, and friends will betray you. And they will even kill some of you. Everyone will hate you because you are my followers, he says, and not one, but not one hair of your head will perish. I had to question God on this, and let me just read the last part of it. It says, by standing firm, you will win your souls. Because when, when I read, not, I mean, what is, what is this talk about not one hair of my head, but you just said that some will be killed, and then you're saying that not one hair on your head will perish. But the thing is, is perish doesn't mean die. It means to give up. So he says that when you come to a point in your life that even to the even your hair will not bow down to any other God, that you become so resolute in your faith and your love for God that not even one hair on your head will even think about turning its back on God. You will remain firm and standing. My Thank God. God. Even if it means to die. This is the kind of faith and firmness. That Jesus is telling us to have. To be ready for what is coming. Because in Revelation 13 and 7 it says this. The beast will be allowed to wage war against God's holy people. And to conquer them. When I read this I was amazed by this. And I asked the Lord. I said Lord I thought that you protect us from the enemy. Your Bible says this. We, co we quote Psalms 91. And, and, and many times we plead the blood of Jesus over our lives. And the Bible says that we are more than conquerors through Jesus. And, and has even given us authority over all the power of the enemy. But uh, because Jesus has already conquered the enemy. So why would you allow your holy people to be conquered by the enemy? Why would you allow this? And he said to the believer, death is not punishment. Death is the way to me. Yes, Lord. And just as those who are still or are being killed today, they are now with me. Why do you question why I would allow this? I'm allowing the enemy to send them to me. But we don't have this type of mindset. We get angry with God if things don't go right in our life. So when Jesus spoke about a storm that was coming and our ability to stand firm, he was talking about remaining firm in God even if it costs you your life. For the wise man is one who builds his house on solid rock. And Jesus said that they, they, they are those who hear my words and obeys my words. While the foolish ones, watch this, are those who hear my words but do not obey them. So when the storm comes, they will fall because they do not have a solid foundation under them. And so we have to question what makes us, what makes our foundation strong? Because both the wise men and the foolish men built their houses and both of them had to face the storm. And these houses represent the lives in which they live. But yet one was built on sand while the other was on a solid rock. So what is the solid rock that Jesus is talking about here? Well, Jesus calls it obedience. Well, pastor, I obey God. Hold on, hold on. Before you start excluding yourself, hold up. Because we have to understand that there is an obedience that actually makes God frown. I don't, oh, Pastor, I don't understand that. How, how can obeying God make him frown? There is an obedience that would actually cause for God to frown. For it is called obedience out of obligation. You take a defiant teenager who desires to be with their friends and do what their friends are doing. But they have parents who love them enough to say no. And so even if they obey them, they don't do it. They don't do it because they love their parents. They do it because they're afraid to get kicked out of the house. 
They fear the punishment. And you know what our punishment is now, right? I'm going to take your phone away. Oh, my God, my world is over. Oh, let me tell you, let the CPS uh, preachers rise up and tell their parents, take the phone away. It's worse than Lickens. They think, oh, if I get a go on my phone, I'm going to die. <laughs> and I'm not being that sarcastic. This is reality. <sighs> Imagine telling one of the kids growing up in my generation, I'm going to take your phone away. It's like, take it away. It's connected to the wall. <laughs> but even though these teenagers might be obeying their, their parents, they, they still look at their parents with anger and defiance. So even while they're technically obeying, they're not doing it from their heart. And this is the kind of obedience that causes God to frown. Because this obedience causes these parents who truly love their kids to hurt. Because they, they have to stand their ground and, and be uh, in true love. Because they're not just their, their, their children's friend. They're, they're, they're looking forward to their future of what they will become. So hate me if you got to. But I want more for you. You might not understand it now, but you will when you get older. I had to do this very early with my own sons, and I had to look like the bad guy many times, especially while I was trying to protect my kids even from themselves. And yet I had the privilege of my son coming to me later on in life and thanking me for not letting him do what he wanted to do with his friends. Because he saw how some of his friends died in a car accident from drunk driving. And he also and others were throwing their lives away on drugs and other things. And then for him to run into those friends that he used to run with. And they say how they wish they could have been like him because of the man he has become. But can I tell you that even as a pastor, we've had to apply the same principle here in Faith in Action. And can I tell you, I don't like it. But I cannot, or we cannot allow for this type of behavior or attitude to continue even in ministry. Some people have walked out on us and talked about us because of it. They, we've had to step others down from their positions. But can I tell you that those who have repented and made things right have grown tremendously from it? Because we cannot stand here and compromise truth. And think that God will come into a compromised church because we don't want to offend people with what the word of God teaches. But there are many believers today who will only obey out of obligation. Because they fear hell or they fear losing their blessing. And so they, their obedience doesn't come from a pure place. I need you to hear what I'm trying to tell you. Because there are a lot of believers today that have become very technical with God. And they obey out of a religious spirit. So they don't truly honor or respect the Lord. So much so that they fear being away from God. They just try to appease him so that he'll bless them. Are, are, are y'all hearing me? See, they get angry if, he, if it seems like God is not doing or not holding up to his part of the bargain. If God doesn't start showing up on some, uh, you know, on some blessings soon, people who try to obey God end up giving up because they weren't doing it to, be, to thank God. They're doing it because they want more blessings. Oh, y'all don't want to talk to me. But the rock that Jesus was speaking about. Is really talking about your motive in which you do whatever you do, what, what your life flows from. And at its core is based on true love. The solid rock that Jesus was talking about is based on true love, not use love. The solid rock that Jesus said that your life must be built upon... In order to be able to withstand the storm that is coming, is built on true love, not use love. Yes, Lord. 
See, when some believers pray for God to bless them, they really want God to give them what they want. So in essence, they're trying to use God in order to get what they're really after. And, they're, and, they, and they will even express how much they love God and how, uh, and how much they adore God as long as God gives them what they want. But the moment it seems like he's not, all of a sudden the rapture happens and they're gone. Oh, what, what happened? But these believers will even seem to obey God legally, but in their heart... But their heart is not even in what they're doing. And so they are not built upon the rock. Are y'all with me here? They're going through the motion. See, it is a cold technicality that they are basing their lives upon and not basing it upon true love. And the, their fear comes from the fear of consequence if, if they don't do what God is telling them to do. And so their heart becomes very religious. And so everything they're doing is not based on true love. It's scared. It's being afraid of God's wrath coming down on you. Are, are you all with me here? So even if they fast... Even if they pray, even if they read their Bibles and they participate in worship, even if they give their full 10% in their tithing, their motive is not coming from a pure place. It's all about making sure that God blesses them. Are, are you all with me here? And so they feel obligated to be blessed. And so they tithe to be blessed. And so they fast to be blessed. And so they pray to be blessed. And so they read their Bible to be blessed. But their motive, if your motive is to be blessed, then you're actually building your life on sand. My God, that's true. My God. Because what happens if God don't bless you? Will you continue to obey him? Or will you stop because you didn't get what you actually came for? Are, are you all with me in here? Sadly, we have seen a huge decline of the move of God in many churches today. And yet there are people that are crying out for revival. But truth is, we only want God to move so that we can continue living the way that we want to. Are, are y'all with me? We have a people that are crying out for revival today. But they want God to show up so that they can feel good about the way that they continue to live. There's no preaching about holiness anymore. There's no preaching. Or there's no conviction anymore. There's no getting rid of this. We just want to add Jesus to what we already do. And so we want God to show up in revival. Not because we want to give up our life. But because we want to continue it. And we want God to bless it. Are you all with me here? There's no talk of repentance anymore. There's no talk of turning away from sin. People don't want to be convicted. They call that negative. And we expect God to just show up because we want him to. What is sad is we have just about removed everything that to do with holiness because we call it legalism. Oh, that's just legalism. That's just legalism. And we expect a holy God to show up in a compromised church. Why would he want his people to feel like he condones that type of lifestyle, especially if that lifestyle is going to send them to hell? Why would God show up in a compromised church to deceive them to think that the life they're living is okay? Really, really, we don't want to change. We just want God to bless what we're doing. And so we technically serve him and technically obey him. And we have become power hungry people running to and fro seeking people who carry certain anointings. But we won't take the time to get to know the, to know the anointer and to hear his voice. We have a people who study theology and teach theology. But don't even know the theo of the ology in which they teach. Theo means God. Ology means the study of. They can teach theology, but they don't know the Theo. Oh my God. But when Jesus taught on obedience, are y'all with me here today? Are y'all with me over, over streaming over this internet? When Jesus taught about obedience, he could only relate to it the way he understood it. 
which is the way that he lived it. He obeyed out of a genuine love, not just good intentions. Many people today say they love God, and, but, <laughs> but they really, really, they only intend to love him as long as he, <laughs> as long as it's convenient, and as long as it benefits them. I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. Even if that benefit is to save their kids. We're going to go a little deep here because we have to deal with something. Because even if that benefit that you're seeking God for is to save your kids. Pastor, doesn't, shouldn't we seek God to save our children? Don't you know that God wants your children saved more than you? But if your desire is to save your kids and you're serving God to save your kids, what happens if the enemy uses your kids to turn you from your God? Oh, oh you don't want to talk to me now. You can, your intentions cannot be based on what God does for you. Otherwise, you are not going to be able to stand when the storm comes. Is this truth? Are we speaking truth here? Pastor, I've been seeking the Lord to save my children. That's good. Seek the Lord to save your children. But don't let that be your motive. Your only reason for serving him. We need to seek the Lord to save all of us. But don't let your motive be just to save your kids. Don't let your motive be based on anything that God will do for you. But this is what we've been taught, right? Come to Jesus and you'll get. Come to, come to God. If you give your life to God, everything will go well for you. And so we come to God expecting God to give us everything we want. But what happens if we don't? cash out on that benefit that we've been told and God doesn't show up like we thought he would see when the storm comes everything that you've been seeking God to do for you and your family if it seems like it's removed are you still going to serve him are you, are you all with me here See, when Peter heard what Jesus was about to do to obey his father in suffering and dying on a cross, Peter rebuked Jesus. I, I, I am amazed at this. You know, this is the problem when, when, you, when you carry have people walking with you is because they don't end up respecting you after. And they think that they can rebuke you. Are, 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 are you all with me here? Peter had the audacity to rebuke the Lord. Maybe he got too much water when he sunk in the water in his ears. Water log. He skipped the beat there. He, you know, he's like, no, no, you know what? And he rebuked Jesus. And Jesus replied to him this way. Matthew 16, verse 23, he said, get away from me, Satan. Hold up. Peter was concerned with Jesus' safety. And Jesus rebuked him, calling him Satan. He said, you are a dangerous trap to me. For you are seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. Wow. You're seeing things merely from a human point of view and not from God's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. For if you try to hang on to your life. You're going to lose it. What is Jesus talking about in the storm? If your life, if what you're building your life upon is trying to save your life, you're going to lose it. But Pastor, I thought we're supposed to come to God to get saved. You are, but there's a, there's, there, there, there's a deeper seated meaning that you have to have in your life other than just trying to get a ticket to go to heaven. Because if your only pursuit is just to try to be saved and go to heaven, you're going to miss it when the storm comes because you'll save your life. He said, if, if you're going to be my follower, you have to give up your own way and take up your cross and follow me. For if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, if you give up your life, if you give up trying to live for you, then you're going to save it. Are, are, are you all with me here? You, you all seeing this the same? 
See, Peter's protection of his Lord would seem to be the right thing to say. But Jesus rebuked him saying that you're taking it from a human point of view. How much things are done today in what we call godly, in what we call ministry, that is coming from a human point of view. Peter would have considered this to be obedience. But it was not coming from a pure place. Please understand that much of what we call serving God is not what God calls serving him. Because it's not coming from a pure motive and a pure desire to do the will of the father and to simply please him. Now I want to talk to you really quickly about what this solid rock is. And it is found in John chapter 8 verse 28 and 29. It says I do nothing on my own but I say only what the father taught me and the one who sent me is with me. He has not deserted me for watch this is the rock for I always do what pleases him. This is the rock. And I want you to understand how important this is. This is the rock in which we have to build our lives upon. That I always do what pleases God. Are, are, are you all with me? See, the rock that we must build our lives upon is to simply please him. Now, let me, be, let me be very clear on this. If you don't have it in you to simply obey God because you love him and you want to please him with all of your heart, then you are building your life upon the sand. And when the storm comes, you will not remain standing. Did you get that? If you... Do not have it in you to simply obey God because you love him and want to please him with all your heart. Then you are building your life on sand. And when the storm of life comes, you will not remain standing. There are many believers today that have good intentions. But when the rubber hits the road, they love themselves more. But it's always been about his good pleasure and pleasing him only. That's what it's always been about. Paul said in Galatians 1 and 10, obviously I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. For if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. In, and again, he says in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 4, for we speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God. Our purpose is to please God, not people, for he alone examines the motives of our heart. Are you seeing this? Our, our our entire purpose has to be about pleasing God, not people, because God looks at the motive of our hearts. So it's not just what you do, it's why you do what you do. Again, in Philippians 2 and 12, it says, Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you to do what? Giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. This is the rock in which Jesus said to build our lives upon is to live to only please our Father. So much of what we call of living for God is really living for ourselves. Because we want God to bless us, so we're willing to try to please God to get for us. But if your intention is for this, you're building your life on sand. It has to be only about pleasing him and him alone. Yes, my God, it has to be about him. My God. In Revelation 4.11, it clearly states the purpose of our creation. In the King James, it says, For thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thus thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure, for thy pleasure, they are and were created. We were created to please God. Pastor Nina was just speaking about um, those who are, who are servants. They don't live to, to live for themselves. They live to serve their Lord.
There are, I cannot tell you how many people are serving God today for themselves. They don't want to go to hell. I mean, who does? I mean, we don't want, we, but, but they're only doing what they technically need to do, what they think is required in order to not to go to hell, but their heart is not all the way in. So technically, they're following the rules because they want to make sure that they can go to heaven. But their heart is not even for God. They're, they're actually for themselves. And so you might be building a house in God. You might go to church. You might do all these things for God. So you're building a house, but your foundation is on shifting sands. So this rock that Jesus spoke of doesn't operate out of some legal obligation. It is entirely built upon the desire to please the Father. This is why the law has no application to a person who builds their life on the rock. Because their aim and the aim of this person is what Jesus said the entire law is based upon. Watch this. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your, with what? All? All your heart. So your heart belongs to God only, not yourself either. He says, when you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. For the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. To love God with all your heart, your soul, and mind. And out of that, we'll have a love for other people. And the entire law is wrapped around loving God. People, I need you, and I believe that this is why the Lord has sent this word today, to check your faith and love in God. See, the person who's built on the rock is not concerned about what is considered legal or illegal. Let me help you understand. Pastor, this isn't sin. So your heart is to do what you really want to, but you're not even asking God if that's what you should do. Pastor, the Bible doesn't say that this is wrong. But what did God tell you to do? We are so meticulous and we're so technical that we're trying to find what we can or cannot do. So we're living by a law in order to make sure that we don't go to hell. Are you, are you all with me here? And so we become very technical with God in, in making sure that we're following the law. But if your heart is to please him, you're not even, you're not even considered about what is, what, what is the law, what's not, what's legal, what's illegal. Your only concern is to do what pleases him. That's right. Is this coming through? Because there are people who search through the Bible. Well, the Bible doesn't say that this is wrong. And your whole heart is about doing what you want to do. And you're trying to find out where you, where you, can, where you can hit the gate. Where, how far can I go to the world and still be able to go to heaven? How far can I go to the world? And when, 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 when your whole heart is in God, you don't even go close to the gate. You stay as close to God as you can. Do you know what the definition of sin is? It is hamartia, it is hamartalos. It means to simply miss the mark. And so if your aim is pointed at anything other than pleasing the Lord, your aim is off target and the Bible calls it sin. Can I tell you that before Moses there was no law? And yet Abraham was counted righteous because of his faith. And it was so founded in the love of God. So much so that he was willing to sacrifice his own son. Abraham didn't have the law. All he had was a desire to please God. And God counted him righteous. And the father of faith. Not because he was following the rules, but because his heart was so entwined with the Father. That all he wanted to do was please his God. So it should never be, Pastor, does the Bible say that this is bad? Pastor, this, 
What does God tell you to do? Why don't you ask God? Don't try to get some pastor to legalize what you really want to do. Well, pastor said, guess what? When you stand before God, <laughs> it will not be what my pastor told me this. You had a Bible. You should have read it. You could have sought God. You have knees. You can pray. Or even if you cannot kneel, you can still go before God and pray. People have it in their mind. If I can get my pastor to condone it, then it must be okay with God. <laughs> Better make sure it's good with God. But there are many people that follow a list of rules and regulations and they're careful to strain the gnats per se, but completely, completely miss God. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for this in Matthew 23 and 24. He said, blind guides, you, guides, you strain your water so that you will not accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow whole camels. <laughs> he says, you're missing the point, in other words. You're trying to be careful with all these little things, but you're swallowing the camel because you're not even concerned with God. And then he says this in verse 25. He says, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup. You're, you, you're careful to look good on the outside, he says, or the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. He said, first, wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What is he talking about? Deal with your heart. And then he says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, you Pharisees and hypocrites? For you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled inside with dead people's bones and all sorts, all sorts of impurities. Outwardly, you look relig like religious people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. So you might look the part, but if your heart is not with God, let me tell you, you're not going to make it when the storm comes. Look at your neighbor and say, it's all about the heart. Joel chapter 2 verse 12 says, that is why the Lord says, turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting and weeping and mourning. But don't just tear your clothing and grief. Tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God for he is merciful and compassionate. Slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. And he is eager to relent and not punish. And then he says, who knows perhaps. He will give you a reprieve, sending you a blessing instead of a curse. My God. Sadly, instead of dealing with the heart, many believers today have gravitated to a false grace. That seems to save them from the law. But has become a license to sin. Because any talk of holiness is considered legalism. And so now if there is a Christ follower who desires to please God and doesn't watch certain movies or TV shows, they are accused of being legalistic. But truth is, if your heart is set on God, then you aren't concerned with watching the things of the world. And so it's not because you're being restricted, but out of a desire to please God because you don't want to let no filth into the temple of God. And so I'm sorry if you feel restricted because you desire that kind of a lifestyle, meaning that you're being held back from something that you really want to do. But don't look down on somebody who desires to simply please God and loves him more than their desire to be entertained by the world. Can I make this very clear to you? If you are still attached to this world, you do not belong to God. First John chapter 2 says, do not love the world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only the cravings of physical pleasure. A craving for everything we see. The pride of our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what? There's the rock. 
Anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. God, I just want to please you, Father. It is the love of God that is exhibited in an undeniable desire to obey him. Jesus says in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, it would seem that he's saying that if you love me, then you'll prove it by obeying me. Even the message version says it this way. It says, if you love me, show it by doing what I've told you. But the original Greek actually says this. If you fall in love with me, you will be able to obey me. If you fall head over heels in love with me, then it won't be hard for you to obey me. Your desire will be to please me and be, your desire will be all about fulfilling, oh my God, if you love me. This is why in Revelation, he spoke to the church of Ephesus, Revelation 2 and 4. He said, nevertheless, I have this against you. You've lost and left your first love. What is your first love? It is a love that desires to truly please God. You remember what it was like? You got excited to get your first Bible and to read it. Nobody had to tell you to do it. To spend time in prayer. You couldn't wait to spend time with this father that you had so fallen in love with. No one had to make you do it. You desired to be with him. You wanted to tell everybody about the God who loves you and saved your soul. Can I tell you something funny about me? When I first got saved, I was so excited about God that saved me that I literally wanted to save the devil. I just, I just had figured out that the devil missed it and that he needed to be taught that he missed it. And it's time to repent and turn back to God. But what scares me is there are many who have fallen in love with a beneficial and selfish love for God. That only pursues him out of a desire for personal gain. And can I tell you that I don't believe that they truly believe in heaven or God. Pastor, how can you say that? Because when push comes to shove, they'll turn their backs on him. For there is coming a time of the greatest of all storms. And it's going to hit the world. And I'm not talking about a natural hurricane or storm of that nature. No, this storm will come out of a great tribulation. And Revelation 13 speaks of the rise of the Antichrist and the mark of the beast. And every person will be required to receive it on their right hand or forehead. And you cannot buy or sell anything without this mark. Now the Bible is very specific and it says that if you take this mark, there will be no repentance. All you will have to look forward to is eternal punishment with the devil and his demons for all eternity. I want you to think about this. You would take a momentary mark, even if it lasted for seven years or ten years. You would trade ten years of your life or twenty years of your life for an eternity with God. But most believers today don't really believe this with all their heart. And that's why they're not built upon the solid rock. The rock is a resolve that says, come hell or high water, I will not renounce my God. Like the three Hebrew boys that were willing to go into the fiery furnace, they said, whether we live or die, we will not bow down to your idol. That is the rock that Jesus was speaking of. What we don't realize is this whole coronavirus is a, play, a prelude to the mark of the beast because some stores and restaurants now are not even accepting cash. Because they say that this virus can be transmitted through the, through, through the passing of money. And so they're pushing for all electronic payments. And guess what we do now? We pay with our phones. So what are they getting you ready for? Reach out your hand and scan.
In fact, there's whole cities in China and other places around the world that don't even use cash anymore. It's all digital. And can I tell you that the world is being prepped to receive the mark while most believers are unaware of what's coming. And some would say, Pastor, isn't the rapture supposed to happen before all that happens? But here's the hard truth. Many believers who think that they are ready to go or rapture ready, many believers who think they're rapture ready are not as ready as they think they are. For even Jesus said only a few going to make it. Which also tells me that there are a lot of people who are building their lives upon a foundation of sand. So they aren't ready to face the storm when it comes. What scares me is if you're not fully sold out to God. These people, if they're not, if, if you're not fully sold out to God when the mark of the beast is issued. Many people who have congregated in churches will end up taking it. In order to feed their loved ones. They'll trade a moment of fulfillment for an eternity of burning in hell. It's like Esau, who was so concerned with eating that he traded his birthright. You know why the children of Israel are not called the children of Esau? He was the one who had the birthright. They would have been called the children of Esau, but he traded that. We would have been calling the nation of Esau. That would have been the Holy Land, the nation of Esau. But he traded it for a bowl of soup. He told himself, what good is it to have a birthright if I'm going to die today? I'm so hungry. I need to eat now. Read what the Bible says, Hebrews chapter 12. It says, make sure that no one is immoral and godless like Esau, who traded his birthright as a firstborn son for a single meal. You know that afterward, he wanted his father's blessings, but he was rejected it for it was too late for repentance, even though he begged with bitter tears. I want you to think about it. If you are built on the rock and you know that your life is solid in God and you teach your kids the importance of being solid in their faith and help them to be ready to die for Jesus, Pastor, they're too young for that. No, they're not. If you don't prepare your kids to be a martyr for Jesus, that's what, that's what Jesus said. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, the word witness is the word martyr. He said, I'm going to empower you. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he'll give you the ability to die for me. We have to teach our kids to be ready to give their life up for Jesus because we know, we know that that's where our future is. And so we know that if anyone takes our life here on this earth, it's instant glory. We have to teach our family that no matter what happens to us, we will not turn our back on God. This is the kind of faith that we must have in order to weather through the storm. Praise and worship team, go ahead and start making your way up. I'm starting to move to a close here. When Jesus was speaking about the foolish people, he had just taught about them in the earlier verses. These people that we're about to read, and I've, I've come to the scripture so many times. The Lord has led me to the scripture so many times because it so relates to the, the condition of the church today. But these people, these foolish people who build their life on sand are what I call in the name of Jesus people. Are, are you all with me? You'll hear them say in the name of Jesus everything. Watch this. It says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Matthew 7, 21. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. For on the day of judgment, many will say to me, Lord, they, they are easy to say in the name of Jesus, Lord, Lord. They're, they're very quick to say in the name of Jesus. Watch this. It says, we've, we've prophesied in your name, Jesus, and cast out demons in your name. They're, they're, they're very quick to say in the name of Jesus. And they perform miracles in, your, in, in, in the name of Jesus. But I replied to them, I never knew you. I never had your heart. You did the miracles, but I never had your heart. You, you, you didn't live to please me. 
You wanted to look good. You, you, you wanted to do these things. It was like Simon who wanted the power of God in order to be able to be known. He says, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break my laws. Break God's laws. They see the miracles, but they don't really know the miracle worker. And to the church today, much of this godly character is something foreign. They don't know about fasting, what it means to fast. We think that it's about doing away with certain things. And yes, it can be. But we cannot neglect what it... They, they, you know, you, you know what, what, what we're seeing in this generation? They, they say that's boring. To seek the face of God, that's boring. To spend time in the Bible, that's boring. Not ready for the storm. Not ready for the storm. Look at the study of the word of God as a waste of time. These people have never really given their lives to the Lord. Never really given their hearts to him. Even though they prayed the prayer. The truth is, the only salvation that is going to save you is if God has your heart. Can I say that again? The only salvation that is going to save you is whether or not God has your heart. Now let me make a strong statement. If you dare, if you don't crave and yearn after him, then you are not genuinely saved. Because he does not have your heart. If you do not yearn to be with him. And to spend time with him. And crave to spend time with him. Then you're not genuinely saved. And he doesn't really have your heart. If you have not laid down your life. All you've tried to do is add Jesus to it. Thinking that you could live the way that you want to and have heaven too. Can I tell you, my friend, it does not work like that. Someone who truly loves God longs to be with him. And you don't need a pastor or a praise and worship leader to prod you to read your Bible or to prod you to worship God. Because if God has your heart, you can't help but worship him. And you can't help but read his word. You can't help yourself because you so love him. But if the only time that you worship God is at church in front of other people, then your faith is fake. You, and you don't really love him. We have come, we have to come to the place in our lives where our only desire is to please him and love him. Oh, Lord, help us. Lord, help us. Lord, I want to know you, Father, as best a man can know you, Father. Would you stand to your feet, everyone around here? And wherever you're at, if you're able to stand, stand with me. Right now is a time to check your life, check your heart. Pastor, up until this point, I thought I was saved. Now I'm really scared and I'm questioning. Good. Check your heart. If God doesn't have your whole heart, then he does not have you. I want you to pray and ask the Lord to give me a heart to please him. Let your life be built on that solid rock. Help me, Father, to not just go through the motions, Father, but out of a heart of true love, let my life be lived for you. Would you just let that be your, your prayer, your song unto God right now? Lord, change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true, Father. And we used to sing a song like that. It's like, change my heart, oh God. Make it ever true. 
Change my heart, oh God. May I be like you. I want you to really seek and search your heart. David said, Lord, search my heart, oh God. See if there's any wicked way in me. See if there's any selfish way in me. Lord, I pray that you convict us, oh God. Speak to us, oh God, because we need to be built. We need to be founded and, and upon the solid rock, oh God. You're warning us that a storm is coming and you're about to shake. You're about to shake the entire world. But a people that, are, that love to please you and, and, and their whole desire is to be with you, Father. I believe we'll still be able to remain standing. Because our entire motive is about pleasing you. Allow the Lord to search your heart. I want you to check your heart yourself as well. Don't come to God for selfish reasons. Don't build your life upon the sand. Build your life upon the rock. And let him fill you. Would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for who you are, oh God. Thank you for your word to us today. I pray, Father, that we not just be a people who just hear your message, Father, but actually apply it into our lives. Father, we want to be ready for this storm, and we come to understand right now, Father, that the solid rock in which we build our lives upon is a desire to please you and please you alone. Father, I pray that you convict every heart, every mind, oh God. Convict our hearts, oh God. Help us to die to ourselves daily, Father. Every desire, Father, that we have within ourselves, Father, to please only ourselves. Father, we ask, Lord, that you would reveal it to us, Father. Convict us, O oh God. We need to be ready for your coming. And we know that this is the only rock in which we have to build our lives upon. Help us, Lord. Help us, Father to be a people whose desire is only about you and to live a life pleasing to you. And if there's anyone on the live today or whether you're standing in this building and you have not given your full heart to God, then the time is now to give your whole heart to God. And I want you to pray this prayer, not just as a word. Don't just go through the motion, but I want you to mean it with all your heart. It's time to go all in for God. For if you want to be my followers, Jesus said, you have to deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. For if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you're willing to lose your life for my sake and for the kingdom, you will save your life. Pray this prayer with me. Say, God in heaven, mean it with your heart. Say, God in heaven, I admit, Father, that I'm a sinner in need of saving. For my destination was hell for all eternity. Thank you for not leaving me there. But I believe that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me. So it's only right that I die for him and I give my life to him. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. And I commit that from this day forward, I'll no longer live for myself, but for you. I give my heart to you, Lord. My God, I give my heart to you, God.
withholding nothing back from you. Forgive me. Say, forgive me of all my sins and wash me clean by your precious blood. Come into my life through your spirit. Lead me into all truth. Jesus, you are my Lord. You are my owner. You have everything from me because I belong to you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for setting me free. I give my life to you this day. I'll no longer live for myself, but for you who gave your life for me in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Just thank God for saving your life. storms of life are raging all around. I know to put my trust in God. And I will fix my eyes, Lord, not on what I see. No, only look to you for hope. Cause I can feel your mighty Jesus' love. 
this is your prayer today that your hope is built your life is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness and that your whole desire is to please your father I believe that this spoke to not only new people coming to the Lord but this spoke to many people who have been serving the Lord for a long time this is a time for you to prepare and to be ready for what is coming. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. For now is the time to be ready. Can you say amen? Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise and just thank him for, for who he is? My God, you're amazing, God. Amazing, God. Amazing. I'll give God, give God. The praise that he deserves would you just honor him right now and just thanking him for saving your life god you have my heart oh god i desire to please you father more than anything else in my life that my life be pleasing to you father in jesus name amen and amen how many of you know that god is good yes God is good all the time. Amen. Hey, sound like a shofar blowing to me, so let the shofars blow. Amen. Are oh, we working on this techni technology stuff? Amen. Pastor Nina, are we ready? We're not ready? What are we waiting for? Well, we, we, we can't close service because this is the point where we're going to honor our, not only First Lady, but our Pastor, our Pastor Cassie for her birthday right now. Amen. We're going to do... Oh, okay. Okay. See, I was not informed on this. All right. So, we're going to go ahead and close this out and we're going to do this on a separate live. Um, where we're going to honor our... our um, one and only Pastor Cassie. Amen. We want to thank you for joining us on live today. We, we trust and believe that God has spoken to your life and that you are blessed and you know that your whole heart and life is in God. Amen. 
Amen. We want to encourage you to be with us on Tuesday for our live at five at Words of Encouragement. We're going to continue to be able to. Um, we're going to continue to stream over over the internet and bring the message of, of of God, the good news, into your homes. As long as the Lord keeps this window open, we're going to be faithful to Him. And so we want to encourage you to be with us uh, Tuesday live at five. That's Hawaii Standard Time. And also on Wednesday um, for our Wednesday night service at uh, 7 p.m. Hawaii time. And then once again with us on Sunday, um, which I'm, I, I know that Pastor Cassie cannot wait for this Sunday. Believe me, she's coming to you live. I mean, she cannot hold herself back. She's like Jeremiah, fire shut up in her bones. She got to preach even while she's worshiping the Lord. Amen. So get ready. Because a powerful word and a powerful message is coming to you next week, Sunday at 1030 a.m. We want to encourage you that if you have a need, any need that you have, we have a body of believers that comes together. This is a place of prayer. If you have a need, we want to encourage you to go to our FIA War Room Facebook page and place your need there. We have fire starters that will come together with you and join in prayer to be able to, to, to fight the battle, whatever you have need of. We want to encourage you to like, to follow, and subscribe to our Facebook Facebook page on Faith in Action Church of God Ministries. Also, we're on YouTube on our Faith in Action Media Ministries and on Instagram um, our, in our Faith in Action Ministries. We also want to say how much we love you. Is that is that everything? Yes. We want to say how much we love you, how much we enjoy and, and never take for granted the privilege we have to be able to come into your home and to be able to bring the good news to you. We say God bless you, before the Lord, in the fear of the Lord, and by the power of his grace. Enjoy the rest of your day.